The legal trial attached to Germany's biggest ever accounting scandal begins in Munich today. The former CEO and two former executives of Wirecard will take the stand accused of hiding $1.9 billion of missing revenue. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, who was finance minister at the time, described the fraud as unparalleled in Germany's post-war history. This is the man at the center of a case that sent shockwaves through Germany's financial and political establishments, Markus Braun. Prosecutors accused the former Wirecard CEO and two top executives of orchestrating a massive criminal act to defraud investors. He faces charges including falsifying financial statements, market manipulation and breach of trust. He's been in custody for more than two years. After its founding in 1999, Wirecard enjoyed a fairy tale rise. By 2018, the online payments firm had become one of the 30 most valuable companies on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. We are not uh, looking back, but we're much looking into the future. And uh, I think that the dynamic of growth in the next 10 years uh, will totally outperform what we achieved in the last 10 years. Rumors began circulating early on about fraudulent activity, but barely anyone wanted to listen. Wirecard's success story was just too good. Then, in 2020, after an independent investigation, it became clear. Almost 2 billion euros had vanished from company accounts or only existed on paper. Wirecard's big deals faked or staged. The one-time darling of fintech filed for insolvency. Investors lost huge sums. Auditors and German financial regulator Baffin faced heavy criticism for ignoring early warning signs about Wirecard. Braun denies any wrongdoing. He's instead pointed the finger at Wirecard's former COO, Jan Marsalek, who is reportedly hiding out in Russia and wanted by German authorities. Well, for more on this, let's speak to Lars Halter from DW Business, who's at the court in Munich. Lars, what can we expect from this trial? Actually, Gerhard, not that much on this first day of the trial. I just heard uh, that the prosecutor, of course, is, is obviously uh, necessary in cases like that, will read the indictment, and that is almost 100 pages long. So we will hear a lot of details, of course, in the indictment, what exactly uh, they think was going on at Wirecard. But uh, more than reading the indictment will not happen today, especially that there is, uh, since today is also uh, uh, some uh, kind of formalities that need to be taken care of. So the main part of the trial will probably start on day two. Today will be the reading of the indictment with details on that. It is unclear if we hear any words personally from Mr. Brown or the other defendants. Uh, Lars, a key suspect is the former uh, Wirecard top manager, uh, Jan Marsalek. He's on the run. How important would he be for the trial? He would be very important. He is obviously the key figure, not in the trial, but in the wire card fraud. He is the mastermind, and he might very well be the only one who really knows what exactly has been going on. At least that is what the defendants here on trial are saying, CEO Marcus Brown and the other two defendants. One of them is the former head of the Dubai, um, uh, the Dubai subsidiary of Wirecard. They say they knew nothing about what was going on. On here, especially CEO Marcus Brown, says that, and that Jan Marsalak was actually the only one who did all this, uh, who did all the fraud on the books, who cooked the books. And that is, of course, possible. It is, of course, very suspicious that uh, Jan Marsalak left uh, right before the company went belly up, took a private jet to Belarus. He is hiding in Russia. He's expected in or near Moscow. And, of course, the German government wants him arrested there and extradited. But, of course, in the uh, current political environment, environment that is very unlikely uh, to happen. If he was on trial, it would obviously be a lot easier for the co-defendants, or the defendants now in this case, to point the finger and uh, maybe get off with a lighter sentence here if they could prove that it was indeed only him. But so with him not being here, mm. it is unclear what can be proven, what he did and what the others did. Now, there were early warning uh, signs about fraud at Wirecard. They have been ignored by auditors and by the Germany's government's uh, finance uh, watchdog Barfin. So how damaging is this for uh, Germany, uh, Germany's reputation as a financial centre? 
Good question. Some have called it a disaster, a catastrophe. I would call it an embarrassment only. Uh, you know, of course, Germany always had a very strong reputation for its uh, strict regulation, its oversight in financial markets. That is a good thing. And of course, this is embarrassing and it shows regulation here was not any tighter or definitely oversight was not any better than in other places. In other countries, of course, we have seen similar uh, fraud cases, the multi-billion dollar fraud cases like in the United States or so. And I think it's pretty clear that uh, regulation is uh, not very easy in these cases. And even the best regulators can be outsmarted with uh, fraud, like in a case of, uh, of, of Wirecard. I highly doubt that anybody will base its decision on trading with or investing in Germany on a case like that. And as for Olaf Scholz personally, I guess at least voters did not hold him responsible. They did, after all, elect him chancellor. Lars Halter there, DW Business. Thank you very much, Lars. Hans-Peter Borghoff is an expert on banks and markets at the University of Hohenheim, and he joins me for more. Hans-Peter, welcome to the show. Um, Wirecard is um, a, a crazy story about fraud, about schemes, about ambitions, but it's also a story about um, regulatory failures. What does this story tell us about German oversight of companies, of the banking system? Well, it tells us that we trusted too much into systems and we invested too much in bureaucracy, and we didn't make bureaucrats really responsible. So we built up a lot of rule, a nightmare of rule in Europe. And in the end, when we came to decisive points, things were done too slowly, things were done with too few resources. Nobody take, did take responsibility. So everything was somehow on the table already a long time before the crash happened. And so much of the, of the damage could have been prevented. But the administration simply didn't work because we trusted into the systems and did forget that in the end, we need people to take responsibility. And this didn't work. You know, Wirecard was touted as a, a very modern tech company in a country that, frankly, was after tech companies. Um, you know, many German companies, as you know, uh, the most valuable ones were founded in the 19th century. You think of Siemens, you think of some older companies. Um, how, how important was that designation that this was Germany's real tech giant? How important was that for everything that followed, including for us, perhaps, in, in the media? Oh, we were very happy to have a fintech unicorn we saw now participating that. Some of us forgot that innovations in Germany often happen more inside companies and that the, the, this, uh, this market for, for startups is not that important as in the United States where you have to have this because the main drive of innovation. So we were really looking at that and the politicians like to, like to be close to this shooting star. So Wirecard had a very, very good political network and even when they were already on the absolute downward track, some political politicians tried to save it, tried to get money on it. And there was also some kind of hubris. So they wanted to take over the old and, and, and big Deutsche Bank and did things like that. So it was a real fantastic story, although behind it there was just criminal activity and, and uh, fraud and, and all the bad things that, that you can do with money. Have the regulatory failings been addressed since Wirecard imploded in 2020? Is Germany on the right path? And luckily, we'll know when the next crisis comes and we'll find out if the regulator really acted when it was necessary. Up to now, the regulator is toughening the, the control. Uh, sometimes this gets more bureaucratic, which is maybe the wrong way. But being tough is also a good thing. We've got a new boss who really goes into the matters, really tries to make the regulator stronger. Uh, but if this really works, we don't, I, I'm not sure about it. The bad thing is, it gets also more bureaucratic. We get more bureaucrats, we get more rules. And in the end, what we need is a regulator who really acts if there's a threat to the stability of the financial system and if there's a threat that some criminal activities like that take place in one of the large players in this market. All right, Hans-Peter Borghoff with the University of Hohenheim. Thank you very much. Pleasure.